Welcome. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about um, the second biggest scandal of the 1970s. Um, and we had Watergate. Well, this one is Foodgate, and you'll see why this is as we, uh, as we go. All right. I think you're aware that we have a health care crisis in this country. Yes? Yes. yes. Uh, question is why? So if you look at the causes of preventable disease on this slide here, what you will notice is that a lot of the things that have to do with behavior are getting better. For instance, smoking, down. Cholesterol, down. Blood pressure, down. Physical activity, up. We should be reaping a health benefit. We're not. Why? Because obesity is up and diabetes is through the friggin' roof. <laughs> and the question is, why is that? Diabetes, when I started medical school, diabetes was for people over 65. Now it's for children age eight. And the question is, what in the world is going on? So this paper in Lancet was written in 2000. Okay? And it was projecting what was going to happen around the world by the year 2010. And you look down here, it says, we, went, we, we were at 151 million in 2000, and it said we would reach a, a, a prevalence of 221 million. That would be an amortized increase of 3.8% per year. What we ended up seeing was instead 285 million, which was an amortized rate of 8.9% per year. And in the next four years, we saw 412 million. That's an amortized rate of 11.7% per year. In other words, the more time goes on, the faster this is going. WTF. <laughs> when we thought we knew what was going on. So here we have the projected costs for healthcare. So in red we have hospitals, for green we, in green we have physician costs, and in uh, purple we ha uh, blue we have uh, pharma costs. And they don't even come close to the staggering overall costs of healthcare because all the rest is going to the care of chronic metabolic disease, such as diabetes. The problem is that all of the health care policy, all of the uh, uh, stuff that you've heard about with ACA and Trump care and every other kind of care ignores two inconvenient truths. And those truths are, number one, there is no medicalized prevention for chronic metabolic disease. There is only treatment. And those pharma companies are really happy to sell you those chronic treatments because you're going to be on them for 20 or 30 years. In fact, all the pharma companies have basically abdicated the search for acute care drugs like antibiotics in favor of all of these chronic care drugs that you're going to be on forever. The second inconvenient truth is you can't fix health care until you fix health, and you can't fix health until you fix diet, and you can't fix diet until you know what the hell is wrong. And we've got it wrong. And the reason was Foodgate. So, how did it start? It started here. Everybody remember this Time Magazine cover? Yep, the, now the bad news, right? So that was 1984, and that was followed up by this Newsweek cover, and this said six million kids are seriously overweight in 2001, and now it is 24 million. Knowing everything we know, with all of the healthcare uh, 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 efforts, with all of the NIH funding, with all the obesity programs, with Michelle Obama's vegetable gardens, 24 million. So in order to understand this, we have to understand epidemiology, we have to understand uh, uh, surrogate uh, risk factors, and we have to understand randomized clinical trials. So we're going to take those in order. This was the original 1977 Dietary Goals for Americans. Okay? This was the McGovern Commission. This is what they told us to do with our food. They said, increase carbohydrate consumption. Now, why'd they say that? Because the only way you get things that lower fat was to increase carbohydrate. You have to eat 
Well, you gotta eat something, that's right. And also, remember, carbohydrate was subsidized. Reduce saturated fat consumption. Why'd they tell us to do that? Because they said it caused heart disease, right? And then finally, it says reduce sugar consumption, which was a good idea, except it didn't happen. So here's what really happened, okay? So you can see that the carbohydrate went up, the fat as a percent went down, although as a total amount, it actually stayed the same because we were just eating more carbohydrate. And of course, obesity went through the roof and diabetes, like I said, just nuts. So the question is, was this the right remedy? So we have a study now done all over the world called the PURE study, the Prospective Urban and Rural Epidemiology Study. And what it looks at is total mortality and cardiovascular disease based on the different percent of energy from the different food groups. In the left, we have energy from total, total fat. And you'll notice, it goes down. The more fat, the lower the mortality and the lower the heart disease. Now that is somewhat paradoxical, but actually when you understand what the problem is, it's not. Fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, still below the line. Monounsaturated fatty acids, significantly below the line, because monounsaturates are good, and I'm not gonna argue that, that is good. Polyunsaturates, also below the line. Look what's above the line, carbohydrate. Okay, and this is from all over the world, not just from here. Now, everyone says saturated fat is bad. And they say red meat is bad. Well, actually, red meat probably is bad. <laughs> but not for the reasons you think. And the reason is on this slide, as an example, there are many studies like this, looking at hazardous ratios for heart disease based on, oh, this is type two, type 2 diabetes, I apologize, based on consumption of red meat, poultry, and fish. And what you'll notice is that when you control for the iron and the heme, which is model two and model three, the effect goes down. So it might actually be the iron and the heme that's in the red meat rather than the saturated fat in the red meat, because iron and heme are both oxid, that's oxidative stress, and that does cause disease. So it is possible that red meat is a bad actor, but not because of the saturated fat. Everybody just assumed, because you have to cut the stuff off the T-bone, that that's what the problem was. Not necessarily, it might have been the meat itself. So take a look at this picture. On the top we have Italian beef, in the middle we have Argentinian beef, and in the bottom we have good old USA choice beef. What do you see? Yeah, there's a lot of fat in ours, isn't there? Yeah. USA, corn-fed beef. Because that's what happens when you corn-feed animals. Take a look at the Argentinian beef. You know, they eat twice as much beef as we do. We eat 23 kilos a year, they eat 44 kilos a year, and they have a lower risk of heart disease than we do. Because they eat that beef. Because their cows graze in the Mendoza Valley and eat grass. Ours eat corn. So the question is, what is it about eating corn that's a problem? And I will tell you that your muscles look just like that because you ate that beef. So corn has high levels of branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. And when the liver utilizes those for energy, it has to take the amino group off and it then goes straight into the Krebs cycle, ends up promoting liver fat accumulation in the liver, which then gets exported out to the muscle. And this study done by uh, Chris Newgard over there in the upper left shows that as the branch chain amino acids go up, so does insulin resistance. That means heart disease and diabetes. And that's the pathway that it takes there in the bottom left. And over here is yet another potential reason why our red meat is particularly bad, because it has a lot of choline. So choline is an important part of muscle, like acetylcholine. It's a, a part of a neurotransmitter. You have to eat it. It's also part of phosphatidylcholine, which helps you transport lipids. Bacteria in your intestine break choline down to something called trimethylamine, 
which then gets oxidized to something called trimethylamine oxide, TMAO, which has actually been shown to be the stickiest, most inflammatory substance that we actually have in our bodies. This is work from Stanley Hazen at the Cleveland Clinic. So it is entirely possible that red meat is a bad actor, but not necessarily because of the saturated fat. So we have to be clear about what we're really talking about here. And saturated fat also includes something else. It's called dairy. It turns out that dairy is protective against diabetes and heart disease. The reason is because dairy has different saturated fat than red meat does. Red meat has even chain 16 or 18 carbon saturated fat like palmitate or stearate, whereas um, uh, dairy saturated fat has odd chain C15 or C17. Okay, what you can see down here is palmitoleic acid, which is a good one, and you can see that the risk ratio goes down for all of those because it turns out that dairy saturated fat is protective. But when you put red meat saturated fat and dairy saturated fat together and just call it saturated fat, you're missing the point. So everyone's scared of saturated fat, and they're still saying it. So let's look at surrogate markers now, okay? Everybody thinks LDL is a bad guy. Who here thinks LDL is a bad guy? Eh, not so bad. So if you look at the diamond here, okay, you'll notice it's a, the hazard risk ratio of high LDL for heart disease is at 1.3. The public health officials say that that is the lower limit threshold for it to be a public health issue at 1.3. So it just makes it. So if it was 1.29, it would be like, so what? But at 1.3, all right, LDL may be a little bit of a problem, okay? Turns out, if you take all the people who are under 60 out of the analysis and just look at people ages 60 to 95, turns out LDL levels correlate with longevity. So when you take the people with genetic reasons out who are gonna get their heart disease early, LDL levels actually predict living longer, not living shorter. So how do you explain that? Okay. Turns out there's a much better way to assess risk, and it's with something called serum triglyceride. Now the reason you don't know much about serum triglyceride is because number one, you have to draw fasting for it to mean anything, and a lot of people don't get their blood fasting. And number two, we didn't have a method for reducing triglyceride. The pharma companies couldn't sell it to you because they didn't have it until about 10, 12 years ago. But they did have statins. They had statins in 1987, and they wanted you to have statins, and they still want you to have statins. Turns out when you do the uh, math and the hazardous ratio for tri triglyceride, it turns out that the hazardous ratio is 1.8, way more important than an LDL level of 1.3. It turns out there are different kinds of lipids in your bloodstream. Over there, the big one on the left is called chylomicrons. Those are the fats that you absorb through your lymphatic system after you've eaten a meal. They're mega and they go to your liver and then the liver churns out these other ones. The one that we're concerned with is the one called VLDL, very low density lipoprotein. That is your serum triglyceride for all intents and purposes. And only your liver makes VLDL. And it, the question is, what does it make it out of? Because it turns out that's the bad guy in the story, much more so than LDL. And I'll show you why. Because it, there's not one LDL, there are two. Okay, and you have to understand these two in order to understand why LDL is not the bad actor that everybody said it was. So in this slide, you're looking at the probability of event-free survival on the y-axis. And what you'll notice is that your LDL cholesterol can be high or low. It's not your LDL cholesterol that matters, it's your LDL particle number. So think of it this way. Okay, you can have little cookies or you can have big cookies. Okay? You can have twice as many little cookies or you can have half as many big cookies. It turns out the big cookies, the big, large, buoyant LDL are not so bad. And the reason is because they're large. They don't get under the surface of the endothelial cell in your arteries to start the plaque formation process. And they're buoyant, they float. So 
the bloodstream carries them along, and they don't have a chance to set up the plaques. The bad guys are the little cookies, the small, dense LDLs. They're small. They can get under the surface. They're dense. They sink. So they come out of laminar flow through the arteries. They are the bad guys. And this kind of data shows that it's the little guys that matter. So when you do the electrophoresis of these different lipids through the bloodstream, you can get what's on the top there. That's LDL, that big hump there. And you can have large buoyant ones. That's called pattern A. And down here, you can also, you, those are also LDL. You can see they're stretched out more. And they're also measured in the LDL fraction. Those are small dense. Those are pattern B. So what you want to know is, OK, which one do I have? How do you figure it out? Since they're both measured when you measure LDL. It turns out 80% of your LDL is the large buoyant. 20% is the small dense. That's the one that's going to kill you. So you want to know how much of that LDL you got, that little one. So how do you figure it out? Well, you got to look at the triglyceride. So it turns out when you're high triglycerides, when your LDL is high, if you have high triglyceride and low HDL, that's in this box here, that's pattern B. So you can't look at LDL levels in a vacuum. Looking at an LDL number and saying you're in good shape or not is garbage, useless, worse than useless, in fact, detrimental, because it will lead you into a false sense of security. What you have to do is look at the pattern. And the problem is that all of the associations only give guidelines for thresholds which is why we are in such a mess. Now, how about randomized clinical trials? What do they say? Well, we all went low fat, right? Because we were told to eat less saturated fat. So we all went low fat. Guess what? No effect. No effect in the Women's Health Initiative. Not a thing. Nada. And it turns out that when you try to lower LDL cholesterol, randomized controlled trials of 41 studies of drugs and three uh, dietary interventions showed no overall benefit on mortality. And most of these trials did not reduce cardiovascular events. And some of the drug studies actually reported harm because there's a whole hidden literature on statins and rhabdomyolysis. So if you want to know what's going on in diet, don't ask a doctor. <laughs> Who should you ask? Ask somebody who doesn't have a horse in the race. How about the banks? Now, the banks are completely transparent. They only have one goal, make money, OK? And they'll tell you so. They only care about making money, and that's good, because they can analyze the data with a clear eye, without rose-colored glasses, and report on exactly what's truly going on. And so this report came out from the Credit Suisse Research Institute, Fat, the New Health Paradigm, and here's what it said. A high intake of omega-6 fats, vegetable oils, has not been proven as beneficial to our health, and trans fats have been shown to have negative health effects. The higher intake of vegetable oils and the increase in carbohydrate consumption in the last 30 to 40 years are the two leading factors behind the high rates of obesity and metabolic syndrome in the United States. Saturated and monounsaturated fats are not 100% correct. Absolutely correct. I stand by, I didn't have nothing to do with this, okay? But I might, I, I could have said it, but they said it, okay? And they said it better than I could, okay? They got it right. And you know what? Some doctors are coming along. So this was an editorial written by my colleague, Asim Alhotra, who's a member of the NHS Health Trust in the UK, along with Rita Redberg, who is a physician right here at UCSF, who happens to be the editor-in-chief of JAMA Internal Medicine, and Pascal Meyer, editor-in-chief of BMJ Open Heart, not exactly lightweights, <laughs> who said, saturated fat does not clog the arteries. Coronary heart disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, the risk of which can be effectively reduced from healthy lifestyle interventions. Like what? like getting rid of excess sugar and carbohydrate. Except that's what we were told to eat more of. No, no. Food gate. It's not, you're talking refined carbohydrate. Refined carbohydrate. Yes, refined carbohydrate. You're right, refined carbohydrate. I left the word refined out, sorry about that. You're right. The problem is there are a whole bunch of other doctors saying otherwise, 
So this just appeared on my screen about three days ago. So the ketogenic diet, sure, it'll cause you to lose weight in the short term, but so would cholera or cocaine binge. That doesn't mean it's a good idea, observed Dr. David Katz at the Seventh International Congress on Vegetarian Nutrition. There is more than one way to eat badly, and the American public is committed to exploring them all. That's the only sentence that he got right. Okay? Excuse my French, this is Okay, and I'll tell you why it's because this is the bad guy, okay? And that's the thing that no one's talking about, except now we are because of the work we've done here at UCSF, my colleagues here and I, okay? This is the reason, fatty liver disease. So over here, we have a normal liver on the left, and over here, we have fatty liver disease, all those fat vacuoles and macrophages and the beginning of scarring, this is not good. Here's a way to look at this. This is called an MRI fat fraction map. And what you see here is an obese person. See the love handles on the side? But I want you to take a look at this guy's liver, nice and dark. 2.6% fat, this is good. This is a metabolically healthy, obese person. This person will live a normal life, die at a normal age, not cost the taxpayer a dime, not get diabetes, not get heart disease, okay? He's just fat. Now this is what you more normally would expect. This is metabolic syndrome. This is fat, and take a look at this guy's liver, 24% liver fat, that guy's got a problem, okay? And now, over here, you have a thin person. Notice no love handles, but take a look at that guy's liver, 23%, this guy's just as sick as that guy, okay? Thin sick, fat sick, fat healthy. So my question to you is, which are you? Do you know? How would you know? How could you know? Would your doctor know? We're gonna explain. We've done some studies here, one of which has gotten a lot of press, New York Times, Washington Post. What we did was we took 43 kids from our clinic here at UCSF who were high sugar consumers who had metabolic syndrome and we removed the sugar from their diet and substituted it with starch over 10 days. And what we did was we took their fatty liver, you see it's in brown or orange because it's fatty, okay? We took nine days of sugar restriction and substituted starch. So we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in, okay? Got the idea, okay? No change in weight. And we cleared their liver fat, their liver stopped making those VLDLs, okay? And their insulin kinetics from their pancreas did better. We reversed their metabolic disease just by getting rid of the sugar. So we now have causation, causation for sugar and four diseases. Diabetes, heart disease, fatty liver disease, and tooth decay. We have correlation, indirect data, on cancer and dementia, we're working on those. We, don't, we can't say conclusively that those are causative yet. And I wrote this article last year called Processed Food, an Experiment That Failed, and the reason is because processed food is high sugar, low fiber. High sugar for palatability, low fiber for shelf life. But the fiber is what re reduces the absorption of that sugar. So fruit is okay, but fruit juice is not. Real food is low sugar, high fiber. All diets that work are real food. And this proves it because this came out just two weeks ago from Stanford Chris Gardner's diet fit study where they put people on a low carb healthy diet or a low fat healthy diet and they both lost equal amounts of weight and they looked exactly like each other. The one thing they didn't eat was processed carbohydrate and sugar because they ate real food. Real food works, processed food doesn't. But that's not what the food industry is selling. Moving on with Foodgate. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so my job tonight is to talk about the cover-up side of the story. And to do that, I like to start off with a little bit of background on how I got to UCSF in the first place. And I received this brochure in 2007 at a dental conference. So I'm a dentist. I was looking at ways to get physicians and dentists to work together to manage diabetic patients when I worked for Kaiser. 
And so this conference was all about looking at the links between gum disease and diabetes, so I was really excited to go. So this brochure was given to me by someone from the CDC who was there to talk to us about our National Diabetes Education Program. And I opened it up and looked at the dietary advice and it said that increasing fiber and limiting saturated fats and salt will help control blood glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol, but it didn't say anything about reducing sugar consumption, which I found strange, since we were talking about diabetes after all. There was another speaker at this conference, and he handed out this book, The Stop and Go Guide for Fast Food. Uh, and he, uh, I flipped open to the page on the drinks, so how can you pick a, a healthy drink if you're eating fast food? And I noticed that Lipton Brisk Sweet Tea got a green light, and it has something like 65 grams of sugar in it. <laughs> and I was sitting at the back of the ballroom, and I noticed the, the guy who was getting up to try and go catch his flight, and I actually jumped up and chased him down and said, how can you possibly say you know, sweet tea is healthy? And his response was, there is no evidence linking sugar to chronic disease. And I was literally speechless. <laughs> I couldn't even say a word. And he just turned, turned around and walked out the door. So I went home you know, after my day job and just started wondering, you know, what is going on? Did I miss something about diabetes when I was in dental school? You know, I started digging out my old textbooks. Eventually, I started uh, wanting to know about the sugar industry and wondering if um, they had something to do with this. So this is actually a screenshot from the Sugar Association's website back in 2007. And when I uh, looked at it, it said they, they were boasting a thousand number a thousand is the number of scientific papers dispelling sugar of the links to diabetes, hypertension, behavior problems, and obesity. And then they listed these government and institutional reports that were apparently exonerating the link between sugar and these diseases. And again, I was just flabbergasted and, and didn't understand what was going on. So I, I started to learn more about the sugar industry and their trade groups and, and who these guys are. I'd heard a lot about high fructose corn syrup, that was getting a lot of attention at the time, but I realized that the cane and beet sugar producers have actually been in the game for quite a long time. Uh, you know, high fructose corn syrup didn't get popular until the 1970s, but cane sugar's been around for, for centuries. So in the yellow, that's where we make uh, corn and corn sweeteners in this country. The green is where we actually raise sugar beets, and the red is where we grow sugar cane. And the Sugar Association, which is the trade group that represents cane and beet sugar uh, growers and manufacturers, has a long history. Uh, it dates back to 1943, and really it goes back further than that. But 1943 is when the cane and beet sugar companies started working together. And so the Sugar Association is the big group in the US, but then there's also an international version called the World Sugar Research Organization based in London. And where you see a flag on this map is where each, own, each country has their own version of the Sugar Association. And so it's a global organization connected through to the World Sugar Organization in London. And then you also notice that Coca-Cola and another group called the International Life Sciences Institute are also connected into these sugar trade groups. And uh, we consider the Sugar Association to be a 501c6 group, according to the IRS. You can actually look up their tax documents online if you're curious. I would recommend it if you're interested in the subject. We treat them as a business league. It's perfectly legal for them to work together and promote sugar consumption. And uh, you know, their program services, they work with scientists to spread their message that sugar is healthy. They have sophisticated public relations programs and education programs, and they work to influence public policy. So uh, I started collecting books from the library. Believe it or not, the Sugar Research Foundation, you can type that into your local library catalog and it will bring up over 100 books published by the Sugar Research Foundation. And so I started to, to get a sense for who this group was. And this one book in particular listed all of the sugar industry's research projects from between 1943 and 1972. So these were the, the types of projects they were looking at, nutrition, cardiovascular disease, tooth decay, diabetes the number of projects that they had funded between 1943 and 1972, and then the number of scientific publications that came out of these projects. So I was starting to get the picture that this group has probably had quite a bit of influence on our public health policy. So one day, I was in Denver at the time, 
I went to my local Denver Public Library to pick up one of these books, and I typed sugar into the local library catalog, and I noticed a reference to the Great Western Sugar Company. And the Great Western Sugar Company had been located in Denver, a sugar beet company. They went out of business in the 1970s. And they actually donated some of their records to local libraries all up and down Colorado. Sugar beets had been a major crop, and so there was interest in agricultural issues and labor issues. But somehow, a few boxes on nutrition policy slipped past the lawyer's screening and ended up in Colorado State University. So I noticed that there were some references to nutrition policy, and so I went up to Colorado State to see what was in those files. And the first thing I found was a confidential memo. This is the exact one, the first one I saw, with the letterhead of the Sugar Association. And what I'd stumbled upon were documents supporting uh, the sugar industry's public relations award that they received in 1976. So couldn't believe that I found it, but I did. So here is an example of, of what was in there. So I had board of directors, memos, documents, financial statements, lists of all the research projects funded. And then here's a, a key quote from one of the board of directors reports. The fact that no confirmed scientific evidence links sugar to the death dealing diseases is the lifeblood of the Sugar Association. So now that advice I got from that brochure at that dental conference was starting to make a little more sense. So I actually uh, teamed up with Gary Talbs, who's a, a science writer very involved in this area, and we wrote an article together back in 2012 that came out in Mother Jones. But I knew about UCSF, and I knew about this guy who's Stan Glantz. I don't know if any of you know him, uh, but he's been a major figure in taking on the tobacco industry. And here at UCSF, we have something called the Industry Documents Library, where we actually have 90 million pages of tobacco industry documents online and available to researchers. And I knew that the sugar industry had been up to m very many similar things. And so I wanted to come to UCSF to learn how to do documents analysis. And that's what brought me here. So because I'm a dentist, I was very interested in, obviously, the tooth decay issues. So one of the first things I looked at was, what were they doing on tooth decay? And in 1950, they were pretty clearly stating their position that the aim of the foundation in dental research has been to discover effective means of controlling tooth decay by methods other than restricting carbohydrate intake. So they were doing things like trying to discover a vaccine for tooth decay, creating enzymes that we could maybe put into our toothpaste or even to our foods that would break up the plaque on your teeth so you could keep eating sugar but have a plaque-busting toothpaste. It didn't work, but they're still trying. Um, Another really interesting thing, so knowing about the, the tobacco industry documents, I started wondering what, what might be in the tobacco industry documents about the sugar industry. And so uh, I actually found that the president of the Sugar Research Foundation from 1943 went on to work for the tobacco industry. So this is a letter that he wrote in 1954. 1954 was the year the tobacco companies announced in the newspapers that they were the good guys in trying to solve the problem between smoking and health, that they were gonna do the right thing. And so he wrote them a letter telling them 10 years ago, a very similar organization, the Sugar Research Foundation, was formed to investigate charges that refined sugar is a primary cause of diabetes, tooth decay, polio, B vitamin deficiencies, and obesity. I organized and directed research projects in medical schools, hospitals, universities, and colleges, which exonerated sugar of most of the charges that had been laid against it. And he wanted them to hire him to do the same thing for tobacco. And they did. He went to work for tobacco and became their associate scientific director. So could it be that the tobacco industry learned from the sugar industry? This is a snippet from a document in 1954, where the industry began to see an economic opportunity in the low fat diet advice that was becoming popular back in the 50s. Uh, this is the president of the Sugar Research Foundation talking to sugar beet technologists, saying, if the American public switched to a low fat diet, this change would mean an increase in the per capita consumption of sugar by more than a third. And they paid attention to what the American public was thinking about sugar versus fat. In 1965, there was a surge in media attention and they clipped a, a full page article that was in the New York Herald Tribune, which was a competitor to the New York Times, 
that talked about that it may be the sugar that you eat rather than or in addition to the type of fat in your diet that increases your risk of heart attack. And that up to now, the sugar hypothesis had been mainly theoretical, supported by only a few studies. And this was the trigger that got the Sugar Research Foundation to start funding their own heart disease research program back in the 1960s to take on uh, this media attention and to counter it. Uh, they were particularly concerned about triglycerides, which Rob was just telling us about. That link between sugar and triglycerides is what this article in the Tribune was about. One of the first things they did, one of their first heart disease research projects, they engaged scientists from Harvard at their School of Public Health and had them write a literature review looking at the evidence linking sugar and fat versus the evidence linking sugar and heart disease. And as you would ma imagine, uh, it came out in favor of the sugar industry. Uh, and we did, a, we did an analysis on this paper. Uh, which took up uh, about a year of my life, uh, but really showed the bias that's in this, this study. Uh, it's clearly a biased evaluation. If you ever have any interest, I have about a 20-page supplement that can explain it to you, but much more than we need to go into tonight. But this review was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. High credibility, obviously, the journal, the Harvard scientists, and Interestingly, the paper did disclose some industry funding, but it did not disclose the Sugar Research Foundation funding. Uh, so that's one example. That was just their first project. Uh, we've also written about their next heart disease project that they took on, which was a, a study in rats. So interestingly, the review had discredited animal studies for having any relevance to humans. And then the sugar industry went on to find their own study in rats. And they were looking at the difference between rats that had bacteria in their gut versus rats that didn't have bacteria in their gut. And then they were feeding them sugar to see uh, if it had made any difference to the triglyceride level in the blood. And in fact, it did. And so here is the, the scientist writing to the sugar industry saying, of interest are the human implications of this work. It could be that those people showing extreme sucrose-induced hyperlipemia, which is another word for uh, high, drag, high triglycerides, are harboring an atypical intestinal flora. So they did this study. They got the, the preliminary results. And then they terminated the funding for the study. It didn't get completed. And it never got published. So again, this is another one that we've written up. Uh, but it demonstrates that the industry was actually getting an idea of the mechanisms behind how sugar leads to high triglycerides going all the way back to the 1960s and early 1970s and not letting on that they knew. Uh, again, going back to a tooth decay example of how they influence policy. Uh, in 1970s, our National Institute of Dental Research there was an article in New York Times saying we're going to halt tooth decay within a decade. We came out with this big plan on research priorities. Well, the sugar industry worked to influence that plan. One of the things that they did, among many, was to submit their own report, their own review of what they thought the research priorities should be for our tooth decay program. And I compared that to the research priorities of the National Institute for Dental Research. And 78% of that report went into our national priorities for dental research. And I mentioned those enzymes and that dental caries vaccine and all those uh, research priorities that the industry was cooking up to take our eye off sugar. One of them also was phosphates. And so here's a quote from the, the sugar report that says, but since it's not practicable to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to mitigate it's cariogenicity, which is mean, meaning getting rid of tooth decay. The point is that language is, is exactly the same. If it's not practical to replace sucrose in our diet, can anything be added to the diet to mitigate its cariogenicity? So our Dental Research Institute, nearly verbatim, took the sugar industry's uh, priorities related to tooth decay. Uh, and then finally, another example is the impact of this 1976 Public Relations Award that the industry was given. The silver anvil is like getting an Oscar if you're doing public relations. And the main target of that PR campaign was our very first review done by the Food and Drug Administration looking at the safety of sugar, which happened in 1976. And in the application, the industry boasted that the report had been highly supportive, making it unlikely that sugar would be subject to legislative restriction in the coming years. 
And so uh, I'm working on a paper right now that'll go into a lot more detail about what was behind that public relations campaign, but they, a very sophisticated campaign to, uh, to influence this report. And then finally, just bringing it up to the present, uh, we actually have had something historic happen, even though those dietary goals in, in the 1970s talk about, talked about reducing sugar consumption, every subsequent dietary guideline since then, then ignored that goal and had very wishy-washy language about reducing sugar, moderate your, your consumption. They were avoiding any type of quantitative concrete limit. And that changed with our 2015 dietary guidelines. They actually implemented uh, a concrete limit saying we shouldn't eat more than 10% of our daily calories from added sugars. But the Sugar Association is still up to their old tricks. They're still funding research. And this is an article in a trade publication where the new president of the Sugar Association is encouraging their members that they're going to keep up the fight. Uh, we're going to make sure that that 10% limit doesn't stick. Uh, their reasoning is that sugar makes many healthful foods palatable, which helps contribute to increased intakes of many essential vitamins and minerals. The 10% recommendation for added sugars would bring our intake to levels we haven't seen in the American diet since nutrient deficiencies were a major public health concern. <laughs> so if we adhere to that, we're going to see major nutritional <laughs> vitamin deficiencies. That's the logic. It's funny, however, they are powerful. Uh, they have a $6 million budget this year. Um, they've already been funding uh, scientific research and supplements. They're lobbying. Uh, they are, have their eye on our 2020 dietary guidelines to try and get that guideline removed. So it's something that we need to be vigilant of. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Laura for our final segment. So I'm in charge of the aftermath. Now, the whole food gate idea was Rob's idea. When I said, well, what should I talk about? He said, talk about the call to justice. After the cover-up, the call to justice, what brought it. Unfortunately, I'm not really ready yet to talk about the call to justice. I can talk about some hopeful things that are going on in uh, the world today around this whole issue of sugar in our diet. Um, so I'm going to um, try to share with you a little bit about how the research you just heard about on metabolic disease, on obesity, and on industry documents research and the Sugar Association, and, in, and I'm mainly going to focus on the soda companies here because uh, they're in the eye of the storm, uh, how that uh, uh, has affected our pu public policy discussions around nutrition and health and the rising rates of obesity and chronic disease worldwide. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the tobacco experience because it's so relevant to what we're seeing in the world right now. Um, so the current focus of the policy debate, and I'm not just talking about in the Bay Area, I'm not just talking about in California, the United States, I'm talking global. We are seeing rising rates of obesity and diabetes all over the world, developing countries, developed countries, and a lot of the flashpoint at this point in the, in the uh, debate is around soda. And a lot of the time, the soda industry says, why us? Why are you picking on us? And well, because they're the first, uh, first part of the problem. Well, uh, the public health community is going to be moving forward into thinking about um, junk food. And we're already seeing in some parts of the uh, country, like the Navajo Nation, which has a soda tax, they've created a fat tax. So they're also taxing processed food. And that's also happening internationally. But right now, the focus on soda uh, is really largely driven by the fact that this is the main source of added sugars in our diet. It's about 36% of the daily calories we consume in sugar is coming in the form of soda and sugary drinks. So it's low hanging fruit from a public health standpoint. Uh, it also, these are products that have virtually no nutritional value. They have nutritional, uh, they have uh, uh, addictive substances added. Originally, uh, Coke had uh, cocaine. Now it has a lot of caffeine. There's a debate that you'll be hearing about later in this series on the addictive properties of sugar, potentially. And of course, research, regardless of what the industry says, and they conti continue to maintain, not just the Sugar Association, but the soda companies as well, 
maintain that their science shows their products have no relationship whatsoever to weight gain, obesity, diabetes, anything bad in our, in our nutritional landscape. So that's why soda. So I think the debates and the way this debate is shaping up right now has a lot of um, parallels with the tobacco uh, story. And um, it's easy to forget that back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, everybody smoked. It was absolutely normative. Even buying cigarettes and uh, smoking in the hospital bed. We're in a medical school here. They were selling cigarettes. <laughs> Crazy. And, and today, we just take our clean air for granted, right? You know, we think about, we go on an airplane, we don't think about having been suffocated the way we used to be by smoke. We don't go into a hospital wondering where the cigarette machine is, right? We just take this all for granted. And so the norms have completely shifted. And in a, from a sociological standpoint, in not that much time, norms change slowly, culture changes slowly, but it has been literally decades that we've seen this come about. And so just like seatbelts, and cars, uh, seat belts and airbags and cars, motorcycle helmets. What this is about is getting basic public health protections in place. And in each of these areas, including tobacco, it was a huge public health battle at the time. And that's what I think is going on right now around sugar. We're in the beginning stages of that kind of a knockdown, drag out public health battle. Now, this is the kind of picture that epidemiologists all around the world would hope to someday live long enough to be able to see this for the obesity epidemic, for the diabetes <laughs> epidemic. The black line shows you rising tobacco consumption in the United States. Right around, in 1964, the Surgeon General issued a report that said, hey, people, wake up. This is smoking causes cancer that got publicized, and by the 70s, you start to see the decline in, a uh, precipitous decline in tobacco consumption. And a couple years later, the blue is men, the uh, red is females, you're seeing the death rate, uh, this is two decades later, the death rate for uh, uh, lung cancer starts to plummet, right? So this is what we wanna see to hap happen with sugar and with uh, with uh, junk food and with obesity and with diabetes. We wanna see that kind of a, a curve. So how did they do it? How did we do the tobacco uh, uh, war is what they called it, right? Uh, I view this, I've unpacked this history and I think there are basically four steps in the process and you need science like the science that Rob presented, you need unbiased science, you need industry documents work, like the stuff that Kristen's doing, in order to make this process go. So the first thing is public health officials who aren't afraid. They stand up. In the case of tobacco, it was the Surgeon General and a committee that buck the trend. We don't care if everybody's smoking. We don't care if this, there's a powerful lobby here. We're gonna tell the truth. And they, they compiled the science, and this report is credited as really being a linchpin in the tobacco uh, debate. Uh, the second thing uh, has to do with taxation, and this is what we're starting to see right now in countries around the world and in the Bay Area with soda taxes. Uh, taxes on, on, on cigarettes, they, they trigger what I call a virtuous cycle of policy making, because they accumulate money, they, on the one hand, they can discourage people from buying the product, but in some ways what's more important is that they, do, that they give governments money that they can pour into, say, uh, lung cancer prevention. And what's, what's happening right now is the beverage industry is claiming that the taxes on soda are too small to make a difference, but this is exactly what happened with tobacco. And at first they were very small, and now in some states, these ones in red, you have to pay $4 in tax just to buy a, a pack of cigarettes. So at, we're now at the point where most people who smoke wish they didn't. This is partly why. 
And so, uh, and by the way, even a small tax, so Mexico has a soda tax that's half of what's recommended by most of the expert committees, and they see, saw in their first year initially a 6% decline in soda sales, and by the end of that year, a 12% decline. And that's with a tax that's supposed to not even be um, all that large. So the taxes start small, and then governments start to raise them. And ultimately, in the food, in the food fight, uh, we're likely to see the taxes go into junk foods and processed foods. I mean, that would be the trajectory from a public health standpoint we'd like to see. Now, where do those tax dollars go? One of the most important things that we do with them is public education. And this is a good example of the kind of vivid uh, uh, graphic image that you got in the counter-advertising campaigns uh, around uh, tobacco cessation. Uh, this is a, um, and I'm going to show you some examples from our sugar story. The other thing the, 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 that governments can do with the tax money is roll out warning labels. Uh, these are some very graphic images. The tobacco lobby was able to oppose their use in the United States, but all of the research shows that graphic images, images that are large on the container, make a difference in shaping people's consumption behavior. And then finally, the, the penultimate thing that happened with tobacco was we got the first UN global treaty to, pr to protect public health. 181 countries signed on to the convention treaty the, uh, for tobacco control. And it was passed in 2003. And this is a piece of le legislation that enacts universal public health controls all around the world. Just the basic package of stuff we need to prevent disease. Taxation, warning labels, counter-advertising, plain packaging, that kind of thing. So that's the tobacco story. That's how we got this. This wonderful thing that we're hoping we can see with the obesity uh, crisis, and uh, and so where are we at now? If we were to imagine that this was what's going on with the obesity epidemic, diabetes epidemic, we're probably in around 1970. We started to see a decline in soda consumption. It peaked in the 19, late 90s, and we're now down 25%. So we're already on the downhill of the consumption curve. It's going to probably take some time before we start to see dramatic, see that tipping point in the disease profiles. We haven't started seeing it for obesity yet, but we have for diabetes. We've start, started to see that the diabetes incidence rate is going down. So this is, so this is very helpful. The other thing we're seeing is sugary beverage taxes. And if, if people are interested, I'm in the um, eye of the vortex around soda taxes, so if you're ever interested in knowing about it, I can tell you a lot about it from the inside. Um, currently, we've got eight US localities uh, that have a soda tax, uh, but globally, look at that, 30 countries. Now, uh, th so th this is where the momentum is taking off, and this is no different from, from tobacco. Uh, the U.S. is the last to sign on. We still haven't formally signed on to the convention treaty officially uh, because we produce the stuff, right? And then we export it around the world. So we're the last to go. The other thing we're starting to see are the kinds of graphic counter-advertising campaigns. This is this wonderful, I would have shown you the commercial if I had time, but uh, it's called Man Drinking Fat. And basically, the New York City Health Department put uh, globules of fat into a Coke can and you just watch the guy drink it down. But this is the kind of graphic image we know from research, this is what grabs people's eyes and it changes the norms, right? It makes people think twice before they reach for that product. And then we're also seeing in our own city of San Francisco the first uh, warning label on soda, uh, warning label legislation to pass. Uh, this unfortunately was passed in 2016. The American Beverage Association, the trade organization for the soda companies, quickly sued our city. And currently it's hung up in the courts. Uh, one of the issues they have with it in their lawyers is the size of the warning label, right? And I mentioned, <laughs> this is actually the Coca-Cola sign, right? When you're driving in on the freeway? This is what it would look like if, this, if our uh, city uh, was able to actually implement the law that it passed. Now, I just want to really uh, reinforce, and I, I can't tell you too many uh, stories from the field, but um, 
what a big battle this is for public health advocates and for groups within civil society that are taking this on. This is not, um, a, 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 it, it is no small matter. The New York Times featured this case uh, recently of a Colombian, she's actually a physician, um, and she runs a consumer rights uh, organization in Colombia, and she, her group dared to educate the pu public about the hazards of sugar and soda. What happened to her was she was threatened, she was harassed, she was physically threatened, and ultimately her government censored her whole organization so that she's no longer able to speak about the health risks associated with sugar consumption. So this is, and uh, while the, the New York Times uh, journalists weren't able to get anybody from the industry to uh, own up to um, being involved. The Colombian ver uh, arm of the, of, of the Beverage Association didn't say they didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, this is uh, bringing it home. Uh, this is a little excerpt from an email that showed up in the, remember the Hillary Clinton DC leaks documents? Well, her aide had a, a little side gig working for Coca-Cola. And so we, courtesy of this, we got about 300 documents on the Coca-Cola Corporation. I'm gonna focus a little more on Coke here because they are the largest, they own about uh, 30, they own 31% of the global market share in sugary beverages. So they are the leader in the market. And, um, and, and the DC leaks documents, this one showed up. There were some um, actually uh, about uh, colleagues of mine that got tra uh, trailed when they were going around and giving talks about um, uh, food politics and so forth. But this is one on the, our own uh, San Francisco and Oakland soda taxes, Assemblyman Bloom, put a state of California tax, and they, what you can see here in red is they are uh, alerting each other to the fact that they are following this, these uh, taxes. This document is pages and pages. Every tax anywhere, uh, Russia, anywhere that there was a consideration uh, uh, of a, ta a government even deliberating, you would see uh, a report on what we're doing. Uh, in Oakland, the coalition groundwork is underway in Oakland to build early opposition to the potential beverage tax proposal before they even announced they were gonna put a, a ballot measure out there in Oakland. So these are, these are hard-won battles by public health advocates. And of course, they're outgunned, right? These companies have a lot of money. Uh, in in uh, San Francisco and Oakland alone, uh, they spent $31 million uh, trying to convince us that we shouldn't uh, vote for soda taxes in one election. Uh, so, uh, we're seeing some encouraging trends. We're seeing the beginning of what I am hoping is a virtuous cycle, like what we saw with tobacco, uh, but we're still, um, we're still a long way off from uh, having solved that, uh, the, the situation. And the cover-up definitely continues. So in this last part, I just wanna talk a little bit about how these companies, and, and I'm gonna mainly focus on Coke, I'll leave Pepsi alone for tonight, but, uh, uh, and, and how they're reacting to the situation. So this is a quote from uh, 2007. As Rob showed, the obesity epidemic was uh, in full force by then. And this is a marketing executive. Our Achilles heel is the discussion about obesity. It's gone from a small, manageable <laughs> US issue to a huge global issue. It dilutes our marketing and works against us. It's a huge, huge issue. Now what's interesting about this quote and others, there are others like it in some of the documents we have, is that if you were to look at the forward-facing uh, corporate response to the, to the obesity epidemic, you'd see a much kinder, friendlier kind of approach. And in fact, uh, the CEO of, current CEO of Coke right there, uh, uh, we must grow with conscience, grow our business with conscience. Uh, we, we need to grow it the right way. And, the, and really, at this point, the company is 
is trying to get us to believe that they are mainly interested in being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And so they're, uh, they're uh, reformulating into smaller package sizes, they're marketing more water, they've uh, dramatically expanded their, uh, their uh, beverage offerings beyond just the red can. And they're coming up with these wonderful products like anybody try to Coke Life? It's it's a um, it, well you can see it's green it's in a you know it's it's really good for you right it's really <laughs> increases your life right it's actually uh, uh, it's it's not sweetened with with uh, high fructose corn syrup like most Coke here is right it's got a combination of beautiful healthy what <laughs> uh, cane and beet sugar which is way better than high fructose corn syrup. And uh, what they plant extract stevia, or leaf extract, sometimes they talk about it, right? This is uh, more, more commonly referred to as health washing. Uh, so here's the cover up part. This is actually another one of these documents that came out of the DC leaks. And this is actually Coca Cola's European game plan for doing everything they possibly can to forestall or make public health regulations that we know would work go away. And so on the, on the y-axis, you've got the business impact, with how much they think it's gonna affect their bottom line. And then on the x-axis, you've got their best guess at whether this is really gonna happen. So uh, things like taxation, they view as very likely and we need to fight back. Uh, some of the other, uh, you know, like uh, public procurement, you know, there are a lot of different uh, approaches. I mean, they, came, they, they are following some uh, public health regulations that I don't even know, I didn't even know existed, but are potential ones, like mandis, mandatory recycling. And, uh, but those are things they're monitoring. Now, their fight back piece, they never say, we're, fight, we're fighting back. What we get is, is this persona, right? They do it all through the International Beverage Association. It looks a lot like the Sugar Association. It's all over the world. And in the States, the American Beverage Association. Um, the other thing that they've done is they've, uh, as I mentioned, they continue to deny that there's any connection between uh, soda and sugar and weight gain or obesity. And they have plenty of industry-funded science to make their case, right? Uh, these are scientists who are paid for by the industry to produce bad science, uh, like Kristen was explaining. What they're doing right now is they're promoting the idea that we can drink all the soda we want as long as we just exercise it away. <laughs> You guys know how many calories you burn on a, on, a, on a treadmill for a couple hours, right? It's probably not even, a, Rob would be able to tell us, it's not much. So, uh, it is, so our products can be uh, part of an active, healthy lifestyle. It's our problem. We just, we don't move around enough. Uh, sensible and balanced diet, regular physical activity. And the focus is on calories, the very, uh, issue that Rob is pointing out is not really the big concern. It's not so much the calories, it's uh, other things that sugar does to the liver and so forth. Uh, same with the American Beverage Association, it has its balanced calories initiative. And this, anybody recognize her? <laughs> she was running our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention within of HHS. Uh, uh, she just stepped down in January, Brenda Fitz Fitzgerald, uh, because she was caught uh, buying tobacco stock after having taken over her role running our main uh, public health protection agency. Um, so her, what she think? Solve, this is off the Coke website. Solving childhood obesity requires movement. Those kids, it's all their fault. They're lazy. Uh, the other thing that they're doing is what they call transparency initiatives. This is industry-wide, but this is an example from Coke. Uh, what, here are what they do, uh, courtesy of people like Kristen who have gotten them on the defensive about paying off scientists and dental organizations and health organizations. They said, okay, 
We'll just come clean and we'll just put on our website all the organizations and individuals that we pay for. And we won't stop paying them, but we'll, we'll be transparent about where we're putting our dollars. And, and, and this is a who's who of in, in the public health world. And then finally, as, um, as uh, Kristen mentioned, they still are working through these uh, front groups. She mentioned ILSI, International Life Sciences Institute. This is a global um, uh, organization, its mission, You'd never know that they were funded by the tobacco and beverage corporations, bringing scientists together to improve environmental sustainability and human health. What's wrong with that? <laughs> They're uh, very, there's not much transparency there. So to sum up from our panel, uh, first we heard from Rob about medical research and that it suggests that excessive sugar consumption is uniquely harmful to health not just the, uh, above and beyond the calories in the, in the sugary products. Uh, Kristen shared a little bit about the sugar and, uh, and beverage industries and how influential they are in nutrition science. And then finally, I kind of brought it home to talk about how that evidence from the medical research and from the industry documents has played such an important role in uh, queuing us up for a global conversation about what we're gonna do about obesity and cardiometabolic disease. Thank you. The question was, can we talk about the benefits of stevia? And the answer is no. We can, we can talk about it, but there are no documented benefits as of yet. Here's the problem. We have the pharmacodynamics for stevia. It doesn't hurt you in terms of the chemical. Roboticide A is not dangerous. It passes through your urine, doesn't seem to do anything other than be sweet. Here's the problem. You put something sweet on the tongue. Message goes tongue to brain. Sugar bolus is coming. Message goes brain to pancreas. Sugar bolus is coming, get ready to release the insulin. But then the sugar bolus never comes because it was stevia. What does the pancreas do? Does it go, man, I was waiting for that. Guess I'll just wait till tomorrow. Or does it go, you know, I got all these insulin vesicles sitting here, ready to explode into the bloodstream. I'm gonna go find me some calories to work on. And you end up overeating. There, you end up overeating. Overeating, sorry. Searching for real sugar? Potentially, or just extra calories because insulin drives food intake. So right now, there are four studies that I know of that are acute studies, not long-term chronic studies, but acute studies that suggest that by adding stevia, at least acutely, you end up overeating later. So it may not be a benefit after all, but we don't know that yet. We, on, if you go to ucsfsugarscience.org, you can find some reviews and people have asked, asked these, this question. When our medical librarian looked at the literature, it was all funded by producers of stevia. And so we, we, that's why we have to be agnostic on the issue. Until independent scientists start doing the studies, it's, we're limited in what we can say. Um, when you were showing slides of the fatty liver, um, if you went to your doctor and asked for an x-ray, could he show you what your liver looked like? No. <laughs> you can't. You, there's, you, let's put it this way. If you paid him $1,300 for an MRI of your liver, then you could look, but that's what it would take, and there ain't no insurance company that's gonna do that. That's gonna pay for that. So, I was gonna say, following up from the question, what tests, if somebody was concerned about their own health, what tests would you suggest they do ask their doctor or nutritionist to run? So what we do in our clinic, and it works for adults as well as children, Fasting insulin, fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C are the last things to change. That's what your doctor knows to order. They're the last things to change. If they're already high, the horse is out of the barn. So fasting insulin, ALT, alanine aminotransferase, 
It's a measure of liver fat. It's a proxy for liver fat. Uric acid, which is a proxy for sugar consumption, and most importantly, lipid, fasting lipid profile, specifically focusing on the triglyceride to HDL ratio, which it tells you whether or not those LDL particles are small, dense, or large, buoyant. What about alcohol consumption? What about it? Is it the same effect as sugar? Absolutely. So, sugar and alcohol have exactly the same biochemical profile in the liver. And that's why children are getting the diseases of alcohol without alcohol. Type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease were the diseases of alcoholics before they were the diseases of 13 year olds. Okay? And the reason is because sugar and alcohol metabolize the same way in the liver. Doesn't the alcohol difference. Metabolize first before anything else? Sorry? Isn't alcohol the first? Metabolized? What do you mean? I don't understand the question. That it would be metabolized before food, before product. Uh, so if you, you mean if you uh, c consume a Captain and Coke, would you consume the Captain before the Coke uh, metabolized? Is that what you mean? I don't know what you mean. They come together. The point, is, the point is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step. For sugar, we do our own first step. But after that, the mitochondria in your liver don't care where it comes from. and so. Ultimately, sugar, alcohol, same thing. And that's why kids get these diseases today. Yeah, so uh, the question is really around the, co the high cost of eating healthy diet and what do we do about that? And one strategy is to raise the cost of an unhealthy diet. And ideally, when you're doing that, you're collecting tax dollars that you then uh, devote to getting, uh, to in one way or another, lowering the, the costs of a healthy diet. So at least getting people access to food. Uh, food repurposing programs. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can do it, but you need money, <laughs> to, especially these days, uh, to implement those kinds of policies. And that's why taxation is such a wonderful first step in this cycle of public health uh, uh, regulations. I'm going I'm to add to that, okay? The tax is actually the third tax. The first tax is the subsidy, the subsidy for the problematic foods, the commodity foods, because when you, ta when you subsidize one thing, that means you have to tax everything else in order to make e break even. Number two is the fee you pay every time you go see a doctor for obesity-related health services, whether you're obese or not. That's a tax, whether you want to call it or not. And number three is the tax on the soft drink itself. You could wipe all three of those out by just getting rid of the subsidies in the first place. So the Giannini Foundation at UC Berkeley modeled that question. What would food prices look like if we got rid of all food subsidies? Because there's no economist on the planet who believes in food subsidies because they distort the market. So if you actually got rid of them, the only reason we have them is because this idiot thing called the Farm Bill, which made sense in 1933 and doesn't make sense today, but if you got rid of that, what would happen to f the price of food? And the answer is nothing, except two items which would go up, corn and sugar, and that's exactly what we want. So the question was about food stamps and how that relates to purchasing <coughs> sugary beverages and, and sweetened things, that type of thing. Potato chips. Potato chips. Um, well, I mean, that gets to kind of the subsidy issue and, and where we put our dollars uh, related to our, our policies, our nutrition policies, and efforts to try and limit um, food stamp purchases uh, so that you couldn't apply those to sugary beverages have not been successful. They've been uh, blocked. So uh, there's, there's power keeping that uh, from being implemented in the food stamp program, just like there's power keeping those subsidies going. One of the really disturbing uh, policy agendas that's currently being floated at the federal level is the idea of giving people a box of food yeah. uh, <laughs> under SNAP. This is yeah. the America's Harvest gets. Box, they called it. Uh, and uh, in the, our, our country does not have a good uh, track record in that department. Uh, we uh, have a very bad track record in that department of giving boxes of food. And it would be a box of processed junk. And one of the many uh, real concerning uh, uh, policy issues being floated at the federal level right now. 
Um, I have a question. How do diet sodas fit into the health equation? Well, we sort of answered that before. That's the answer is it doesn't fit in. Well, I mean, people that have diabetes think they're doing a great thing because they're drinking diet sodas. Yeah, right. Like people, th who, people with diabetes think they're doing a great thing by drinking diet soda, except that all the studies show that diet soda consumption correlates with metabolic syndrome and diabetes, too. Now, the problem is directionality with these studies, because they're correlation, not causation. So is it that diet soda causes diabetes, or is it that diabetics drink diet soda as an attempt to try to modulate their sugar consumption? And the question is, does it? And the answer to that is, no, it doesn't make a difference. They one, still consume just as much. I want to point out one thing about the artificial sweeteners. So my dad, for example, is diabetic and raised in the South. He loves sweet tea. Every Christmas he makes Russian tea for the family. Uh, he started using Splenda to sweeten that Russian tea. And you buy the bag in the grocery store that's, you know, like, like real sugar would be. You get a cup of it and you pour it in. Uh, I had to point out to him that that bag is actually a bag of corn sugar. So it's dextrose with tiny, tiny little bits of Splenda, the artificial sweetener, in there. Really, that whole bag is corn sugar. They have to have a bulking agent in order to make it like a cup of sugar. Yet, for some reason, they're actually allowed to advertise that as being a no-calorie sweetener. So I, I don't know how that works, but it's definitely not a no-calorie sweetener when you're dumping in a cup of dextrose into your, your tea. Uh, it's a very good question. The question is, what about the effects of sugar on the microbiome? And those studies are in process and they're actually being done here. Um, we think, we think that within two days, the cutting of sugar alters the microbiome significantly, ir irrespective of calories. And that's work done by Peter Turnbaugh here at UCSF. And what the sugar industry knew about the microbiome, according to that rat study that I briefly mentioned, uh, they realized that drinking a large bolus of sugar, so a large Coke, uh, would flood your small intestine and that sugar would be fermented, leading to the production of triglycerides. So that was one of the mechanisms that were, they were looking at, linking sugar to the microbiome and triglycerides and then cardiometabolic disease which they never published, right? All the way in the back there. So what's the difference between like honey or maple syrup? What, how do those kind of... They're all the same. Calorie for calorie, gram for gram, ounce for ounce. They're all sucrose. They're all the same thing as table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee. You know, uh, 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 maple syrup and honey are more expensive. Uh, they have their own unique <laughs> flavor profile, so people tend to use less of them. And anything that makes you use less of them is a good thing. But uh, in terms of what's in them, it's the same. Dark chocolate? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> out, out, out. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, so virtually all of the produce that we currently grow and consume has been bred to be very specific. So the fruits have been bred to be higher sugar, and the corn has been bred to be higher branched chain amino acids, which is, you know, then being fed to the cows. So they're getting metabolic syndrome. That's why there's all that fat in the meat, which we love because it tastes good, but in fact, that cow has metabolic syndrome. It used to take 18 months to go from birth to slaughter for a cow. Today it takes six weeks. Okay, and that, so basically, that cow has metabolic syndrome, we're just killing it before it gets sick. So that's happening to you. And the corn and corn chips. Can I ask about flour, refined flour in particular? It's refined carbohydrate, it's like, like, it, it, it's, like sugar. it's processed food. It's, there's no fiber. The fiber is what makes carbohydrate safe. So brown food, beans, lentils, quinoa, farro, nuts, brown rice, brown food, that's fiber-containing food. That lowers glycemic load. Low glycemic load food, that's called real food. All real food is low glycemic load food. 
Okay? Fiber works. Processed carbohydrate doesn't. Question. So UCSF has uh, banned sugary beverages, but why are the juices still out there? Why are the what? Why are the juices yeah. still out there? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. One thing at a time, yeah. <laughs> we also have diet beverages. We have a lot of uh, nurses who stay up all night and use it for caffeine, uh, even though there's some accumulation of evidence that maybe there are adverse effects on the microbiome and so forth. So um, it was a heavy lift. It was a really, really hard thing to do. And we were the first campus and academic medical center that did it in the country. One of the really exciting things that's happened since then has been that many uh, health systems around the country, Geisinger and, and uh, the Cleveland Clinic and a lot of different health systems ha have, have, have started to do this. But one of the most exciting things is uh, one day we got a call from the National Health Service of the United Kingdom, uh, the entire health system for the UK. And they said, hey, you know, what's that like? How do you do it? And we talked to them and sent them some stuff and helped them. And, and uh, they just announced they're doing it all over every hospital in England is going to stop selling this stuff. And yeah, yeah. So we're hoping that, you know, it, it, like I mentioned, you know, the, the battles, the advocates are under such firepower when it comes to these government policies. And even, not just in the U.S., all over the world, uh, these companies just double down on them. And they're typically re really resource strained. A lot of these are grassroots organizations and very poorly resourced. And so we're trying to think through solutions that would follow a public health model, but that could be led by the private sector. And like you, you saw that picture in, of the, the, the candy striper selling tobacco to a patient that was the healthcare system during the, we were, we, doctors right. would They're tell called their, candy stripers, remember? <laughs> yeah. yeah, for a reason. <laughs> by, by the way, um, to your point about juice, Swedish Hospital okay. in Seattle has banned juice. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it does deliver a pretty heavy load. Uh, there are some, it, it, you know, it, uh, my understanding from Kimber Stan, Stan Hope's lab up at Davis is that uh, probably juice is a little, has a little bit of an edge over uh, um, a clear sugary beverage, but um, that there, that's a very under-researched uh, question. And so, when the bar for telling a patient "don't eat that" is is a lot lower, or or telling a friend, than the bar for passing a law. Right? You want to get it right. We don't want to reefer madness the population, right? And tell them something's really bad and now it's legal, right? And so, <laughs> and we made some, and, and obviously the dietary guidelines have made some bad mistakes around uh, fat and uh, other issues. So we try to, you know, you set that bar pretty high. You need a robust evidence base before you start passing policies. So f the question's about fiber. You know, I've been, I've been banging the drum on fiber. And there are two kinds of fiber. There's soluble and insoluble, okay? Soluble is like pectins, like what holds jelly together. Insoluble fiber is like cellulose, the stringy stuff in celery, right? They're not the same. Okay? You need both. Now, real food has both. Almonds have both. Regular strawberries have both. But you need both. What they're adding to soda, or what they're adding to fiber one bars, or what they're adding to cereal, is soluble fiber, because that's the only thing that is soluble. Otherwise, the stuff would precipitate out, and when you basically get gunk. So you can't add soluble fiber back and expect it to work like the combination of the two together. So what does the combination do? You got a hair catcher on your bathtub drain? Okay, so. It's a plastic lattice work with holes in it, right? You take a shower, the hair covers the holes, and you get an, ins an impenetrable barrier, and then the water won't go down until you clean it, right? Okay, so the f insoluble fiber forms a lattice work on the inside of your duodenum. The soluble fiber plugs the holes in that lattice work, and you form an impenetrable whitish gel. You can actually see it on electron microscopy, coating the inside of your small intestine, which therefore limits the rate of glucose and fructose and some fatty acid absorption from 
the gut into the bloodstream, thereby keeping your liver from accumulating all the substrate so it doesn't turn into liver fat, keeping your liver healthy. And if you didn't absorb it early, that means it gets moved further down the intestine. And what's in the second part of the intestine that's not in the first part? The microbiome, the bacteria. Well, once it gets to the second part, once it gets to the jejunum, it's a free-for-all. Whether you absorb it or whether the bacteria use it, to metab you know, use it for themselves to metabolize, you know, it's probably equal. So if you consumed it with fiber, you may ha it may have passed your lips, but that doesn't mean it passed your intestinal lumen. So just because you ate it, you didn't get it, which is why a calorie is not a calorie, because if you consumed it with fiber, it wasn't for you. It was for your bacteria. <laughs> Therefore, kill the calorie. It's I just wanted to quickly say, I also want to know more about what added fiber really is. I mean, I think there's a huge difference between what we're calling fiber in these drinks versus what you actually get in a piece of fruit. And I think there's an entire industry that promotes added fiber that I haven't even begun to explore out there. <laughs> One more question. Lane. So in, uh, the question is, in the tax debate, what's the passive smoking for obesity? How does your or someone else's obesity adversely impact my well-being, right? And that's what economists call externalities, right? Well, I mean, just look around. What about the first thing Rob said, rising health care costs, metabolic diseases driving it? What about making airplanes bigger? What about the fact that we have so many obese young, uh, young adults that our army can't <laughs> find enough people to recruit. I mean, where, where, why do I, uh, you know, yeah, passive smoking was a, uh, at, at a certain point, s s and advocates came along and, th and, and latched on to the externality argument, but that doesn't mean that other public health problems don't have externalities. Your, uh, so a good example, uh, helmets on motorcyclists. You can, you know, Kristen can, you know, ride around without a helmet. She's a very cool person on her, on her hog, and she can, she can, you know, what, what's it affect me that she gets in a crash and dies? It's her problem, right? No, it's my problem too. I have to pay the ER costs. When they wheel her in, it's, I, it, it's taxpayer money so, uh, a lot of the time, right? And so all of these debates have externalities inherent in them. It's just about how advocates uh, think about how do we spin it, how do we, how do we create an argument and a, set and a case, and those things evolve over the course of a debate. And at some point very soon, I think we're gonna start, uh, well, we've already seen some, uh, what, uh, Credit Suisse did a wonderful yep. analysis of the externalities associated yep. with global obesity. Uh, let me just add. Do you expect to see Social Security? You're right, you won't see it. Because by the year 2029, it'll be dead. And the reason is because Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. You know that, right? You have to have the young, healthy people at the bottom paying in so that the old, infirm people at the top of the pyramid can take out. But what if the young, healthy people aren't paying in? What if they're all on disability, which they are? What if they're taking out because they're on dialysis, which they are? The whole pyramid crumbles, and it will crumble in the year 2029, according to the Congressional Budget Office, in their last estimate. You want Social Security? Stop drinking soda and tell all your friends to do so, too. <laughs> <laughs>